Good morning, church family. My name is David Stewart. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at First United Methodist Church. We're delighted that you're joining us uh, either in person or online for worship. And you may notice that we're doing some changes to the way in which we're producing our online services. We're at a point where COVID is not going away. This transition that we've made to online worship is also something that we want to build out. So in order to do that, we want to go beyond just being a place where you look in occasionally to get some inspiration to being your church family and to being able to connect folks uh, through this medium that we've learned to use. So we're going to be changing the way we introduce the service in order to provide you with some opportunities for you to be able to connect, whether it's as simple as texting in a prayer request, or more importantly, in the long run, being able to do things like connect to small groups online and to do the things that make it feel like this is a church community and not just something you scroll through and occasionally click on, but a vital part of your spiritual journey and your spiritual life because we want you to feel a part of the church family and to experience all that God has to offer for you in your life. That it's not just something that you do occasionally. And it's not just on-demand worship when you want it, where you want it, which is really cool that you can do that and do it in the comfort of your own home or do it out at the beach or on the river or wherever you're at, but that you also have a community of faith you're connecting with people who are praying for you, others who are supporting you, places for you to learn, places for you to serve, so that you get the full range of what it means to be a part of a church family and to live out your faith so that you're able to grow and to mature in your Christian faith walk. Jim's going to continue that this morning as he preaches and he talks about how that's happening for the children of Israel. It's one thing to break the bonds of bondage. It's another thing to learn to live as a free people and to grow fully into this mature faith, knowing that God loves you intimately, but also knowing that we need people to be with us on the journey. And even though we may not be connected in the flesh, that we're connected spiritually and that we can continue to grow and to serve and to do all of the things that it means to be a church family, even when we're doing it online. And so we want you to take the opportunity, there's going to be small group opportunities for you to get involved in, to continue to grow your faith. And they're going to develop as we go. There are going to be ways for you to serve, opportunities for you to give, all of the things that make you a part of the church family, so that you know we love and care about you, and not just to provide things for you, but to help you grow and mature and become the person God has called you to be. I hope you give us feedback, that you respond in the comments sections, that you share uh, this information with your family and friends and others who may want to join you on this journey, and that together we can build something really incredible. But we can only do it with your help and your feedback. So join us as we go on this journey. My name is David Stewart, and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at First United Methodist Church. We are uh, trying some new things online as we uh, try to create uh, a little better atmosphere for folks who are there to uh, get them to not just be viewers, but to also connect and to have ways that they can feel uh, a fuller connection to the congregation as a whole and participate in some of the ministries. Fortunately for you who are in person, uh, you can do some of that by uh, taking the connect card that's in your bulletin and you can uh, fill it out, drop it at the offering plates that are either in the back on your way out or through the uh, uh, art hallway, which still has the display of uh, our veterans that we're honoring. And so you get a chance to, uh, to talk to them and uh, see them, see their uh, uh, displays that have been uh, put together there. For those who are online, you can do that by scrolling down on the Facebook feed and there's a chance there. Uh, to click in and to register your attendance and to ask for prayer concerns and other things. 
We are also excited because uh, this week um, we have had the privilege of sharing with uh, several of our families and you see the flowers this morning left over from the memorial service for Howard Francis and uh, appreciated everybody uh, doing a great job of making that a special celebration for a life well lived and uh, a person of faith who uh, has been able to reunite with his wife and other loved ones and um, kids remember fondly uh, this church is their their church home and a place where they grew spiritually as they were growing up. We're also invited to this afternoon, at two o'clock. Kirby Turner is going to officially retire as a, a doctor, and uh, he's here in worship with us this morning. And we appreciate Kirby for all of his years of service to the community, and uh, be a chance for you to uh, congratulate him as well. Two o'clock this afternoon, Nybert Clinic. Um, we also have an unusual scenario that. Uh, uh, not only a former pastor of Kirby's here in worship with us, but a couple of other pastors with us. So it's a Methodist Pastors Day at First Methodist, but uh, uh, we're uh, looking forward to uh, getting a chance to chat with everyone following the service. So we uh, invite you now, if uh, you are able to please stand and join together with us in the call to worship this morning. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his steadfast love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Come, let us praise the Lord. What are we singing, Pam? We are singing Trust and Obey, an old favorite of uh, many denominations, including ours. It's on hymn uh, number 467 in your hymnal. You'll find those in your pews. And we're going to do all four verses, so sing out in praise.
Our affirmation of faith this morning is the traditional version of the Apostles' Creed found on page 881. If you will join with me in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Sandy Price, our church council chair, and I had a week of Zoom meetings and retreat, supposedly, but uh, it was good to reconnect with old friends from far away, but it is so good to see you all in person today and uh, to be able to talk with folks face to face. So we are grateful you are here. We're also grateful you have been there for your friends in the congregation. We keep the Albers family in our prayer, and many of you were at the graveside for David on Friday and know that you will be there, but it is really hard for Martha. No parent should ever have to bury a child, and so we keep her and her family in our prayers. We also um, lift up the Francis family. Yesterday was a true celebration of a wife, life well lived and uh, really had an international audience. Uh, Jeff coming in from Israel and lots of great music, lots of good stories. And it reminds us of how important church community is when you hear them talk about what this church meant to their father and to their family. So thank you all for all that you did to make that a true celebration of life yesterday. As we gather here in worship, we remember what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and the hope that we have in God's blessing and God's grace. Let us go to our God in this time of prayer. Most gracious and loving God, as we gather here in the still and quiet of this room, we are awed by the amazing grace that you offer to us in Jesus. For the hope that that brings at times when we need hope and comfort. For the gentle nudge the Holy Spirit gives us in those times when we need to share our faith, reach out to someone else, be there to comfort others in their time of need. Lord, as we gather on this day, one day after 9-11 and the great tragedy our world has experienced, all of the changes we felt from that, Lord, we remember that even when our lives seem to change so drastically, that you are still with us and your presence goes with us all of our days. Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you are always with us and that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we always feel your presence.
and know that your love and grace is surrounding us. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. actually going to ask you to uh, follow Anthony's lead. It is good to have the choir officially back and uh, leading our worship service. And I know you were here all summer, but it is uh, 
good to uh, have you back practicing and, and being a part uh, of the service. And I also know that Pam has a special uh, announcement that she'll be making over the next couple of weeks about some cool stuff going on uh, this fall and during the Christmas season. So um, we're excited to have the choir back. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus. We've been preaching through the book of Exodus over the uh, past uh, month, and so we share these words from Exodus 24. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and he rose early in the morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men to the children of Israel, who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jim? Well, good morning. Good morning. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Jim Carrier, and I have the privilege of being on staff here at First United Methodist Church. This week we are in week five of our series entitled Breaking Bonds. Now, three weeks ago... We learn that after 40 years in the desert, God called Moses, who needed to break his own bonds of doubt, inadequacy, and fear, to go to Egypt. God wanted Moses to tell Pharaoh that Yahweh wanted the bonds Egypt had on Israel to be broken and to let his people go. Two weeks ago, David talked about God fighting for Israel, and he fights for us today but it requires taking steps of faith. Last week, David talked about the times when we're faced with familiar battles and our spiritual muscle memory kicks in. And oftentimes, when that happens, God rewards us for having our faith in Him. Yesterday, on 9-11, we remembered that 21 years ago, Many brave Americans graciously sacrificed their lives to save some. This morning, we will look at another who graciously sacrificed his life to save many, to save whosoever will. As we saw last week, Israel battled with the Amalekites. After Israel travels to Mount Sinai, and there God meets with Moses and tells him, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. So Moses goes to the people and relays God's message to them. They say they will do what God says. God tells Moses he wants to meet him on the top of Mount Sinai and that Israel needs to stay away from the mountain because if anyone comes near and touches the mountain, whether it's human or animal, they will be killed. So, three days later, Moses goes to meet God, and God approaches Sinai with thunderings and lightnings, trumpets, and a thick cloud. Moses meets Yahweh there, and there, God would give to Moses ten commandments for Israel to live by, along with 603 other laws and guidelines. Moses comes down from the top of Mount Sinai to deliver all of this to Israel. And as David read in verse 3 of Exodus 24, it says, So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. Let's pray right now. Let's ask God to help us as we dig into something uh, very special. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together to look at your word. And God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it gives to us gives us the truth. It gives to us the understanding of your grace and love for us. And God, as we look at that love and that grace today, God, we just pray, Lord, that everything will be clear, that, um, that my friends here in church and, and online, God, will, will understand. And God, I pray that you will speak through me. Um, 
We just pray, Lord, that you will be with us. Use this message, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes in life, we are introduced to something that is life-changing. Uh, something that makes us look at life in such a different and unique way. Back in 1889, William Gray designed and introduced an invention that would completely change not just the United States, but the whole world. This technological revolution was first introduced in a Connecticut bank. By 1902, there were 81,000 of these installed in the U.S. The payphone, as it was called, had reached such popularity that by 1905, they were being installed outdoors. Everyone could use them, from the wealthy to the common man. They would become an integral part of everyday life, so much so that decades later, every city and town would have a phone booth. It would even find its way into fiction, as it would be used seemingly every day by one Clark Kent. As time would tell, though, eventually the payphone and outdoor phone booth would become obsolete with the popularity of cell phones and internet communication services such as Skype and Zoom. In Exodus 20, Israel too would be introduced to something revolutionary as God would give to Moses the law. The Mosaic or Sinai Covenant, as it would be called, was one of the most important parts of Christianity but would, too, find its way into history just as the payphone and phone booth did, obsolete. During that time, God introduced Israel to laws and guidelines for the need they had at the time. Israel and mankind had a need, a call, if you will, a call for grace. The Mosaic or Sinai Covenant is considered one part of the covenant of grace, along with the Abrahamic covenant. This shows there is nothing Israel has done to earn God's love or favor. God chose Abraham because he loved him. As a way to show his love for Abraham, God made a covenant with him. God promised to send elderly Abraham a son, and from that son would birth a great nation, which would bless the whole world. Christianity.com defines the term covenant as a coming together. It presupposes two or more parties who come together to make a contract, uh, agreeing uh, on promises, stipulations, privileges, and responsibilities. Today we have contracts and agreements that we see for business. And I'm not sure how many in here deal in business and deal in contracts very often. But if someone doesn't keep their side of the contract or agreement. Many times there will be a lawsuit and uh, the matter will be brought up before a judge in court. A big difference in contracts now and contracts or covenants back then were the penalties for breaking covenant. Much of the time, the stipulations of a covenant, especially if a sacrifice was involved, were that the parties were making covenant were saying, let what is done to this animal be done to me if I don't keep my part of the covenant? So now, how often do we see a covenant that's written these days involving the sacrifice of an animal? And we just don't. It's, it's not for this time. Um, probably because PETA and animal rights activists would be going nuts. But it is not for this time. So Yahweh made covenant with Abraham. Don't miss this. God will never, ever make a promise or an agreement that he cannot or will not keep. Abraham, by faith, believed God that he was going to send him a son and from that son make a great nation who would bless the world. And because he believed that, the Bible says it was accounted to him for righteousness. So this covenant was a covenant, first of all, of grace. This was the first part of the covenant of grace. And as we see, the first part of the covenant has been fulfilled as Israel is a nation. The second part of the covenant is Yahweh blessing all of the nations of the world uh, 
as the law, all 613 of them, are written and later proclaimed to other nations. Many times people make the mistake of thinking that God expected Israel to keep and obey all these laws and ordinances, which sounds kind of like works instead of grace, right? Notice this. The Israelites were not required to obey the law in order for the Lord to save them. God rescued his people out of slavery before the law was ever revealed. So God wasn't basing, God wasn't basing this upon works, but God's unmerited favor towards a people of his choosing. So we see, first, this was a covenant of grace. Second, we see this is a, co a covenant of holiness. This law that was given to Moses, this legal covenant given solely to Israel, consisted of ten commandments that we find in Exodus 20. It consists of social judgments that we find in Exodus 21 to 24. And it consists of the religious ordinances from Exodus 24 to 31. Now you may ask, why did God give so many ordinances and guidelines? And if you read the dietary ones, they're just, it's ridiculous. You just don't understand why there's so many of these and why God set these up for Israel. And there's a reason. Because this was God's people. He wanted them to be different. The number one attribute of God is holiness. Holy means to be set apart, different. And Yahweh wanted his people to be set apart and different than the rest of the nations. So that when those nations could see Israel, they immediately recognized how different they were. Now, most of us strive to be different in some other ways. You can see in, in news today and in other places, even when you're out just walking around at the mall, there are people who want to be individuals. They want to look differently. They want to act differently. Um, this covenant that we're looking at for individuals, because we want to be individuals, this covenant was conditional. It was designed to condemn and designed to lead the transgressor, transgressor convicted as a sinner to Christ. Meaning, salvation from eternal spiritual damnation didn't hinge upon obedience to the law. Instead, it was meant for a person to see that they could not gain favor or salvation by being good and obeying the law. In fact, the Ten Commandments were designed not to be a measuring stick of morality and goodness. Now, I know, speaking for myself, some of you may be able to fall into this category also. As I grew up and I knew the Ten Commandments, I'd be like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm, I've kept six of them, maybe seven of them, I'm not sure. So I'm not, I'm not all that bad. And some, some of you may have done the exact same thing. But this is not a morality measuring stick. That is not what this was for. This was to show everyone, every single person in this world now and back then, that they couldn't keep even just one of them. This was not only a covenant of grace, a covenant of holiness, but it was thirdly a covenant of atonement. Atonement means a payment or compensation for a wrong or injury. Now today, let's just say if I leave church and I'm going home on PP Highway and I um, am going over the speed limit, which happens quite regularly, unfortunately, um, and I get caught and pulled over by the police, what's going to happen? Because of my wrongdoing, I'm going to get a ticket. And I, that means I'm going to have to sacrifice from my earnings to pay for that ticket that was given to me for the wrong that I did. Now, the way Israel would sacrifice to pay for their wrong was by shedding the blood of a perfect spotless animal on an altar. So why were animals used as sacrifice? Israel didn't have a passion for animal cruelty. It wasn't something that they just enjoyed and, and, and uh, liked to do on a Saturday night. In fact, to be honest with you, it wasn't even their idea. The model of this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3, after man's sin, and God 
promises a redeemer in verse 15. He curses man, ground, animal, and creation. And after he does all of that, in Genesis 3.21, the Bible says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So where did these tunics of skin come from? God didn't give Adam and Eve a new layer of epidermis that was better than the one that they already had. The tunics of skin were from animals. And no, God didn't shear sheep and make wool sweaters and, and pants or shorts for Adam and Eve. Don't miss this. Right after God tells Satan there would come a redeemer who would crush his head, he models the compensation or payment for sin. The sacrifice that was made to make payment for the first sin committed by mankind was the shedding of blood of an innocent animal. God would shed innocent blood for mankind to make atonement for their sin. And see in this coven, covenant, we see the Mosaic or Sinai covenant displayed the atonement and perfect holiness a gracious God demands. It also trained Israel to look for a savior. It was not through keeping the law that the ancient Israelites were commanded to seek salvation. It was the way they would thank God for saving them. So this covenant wasn't meant to stand forever, this covenant of grace. So we move from a call for grace to a call for redemption. Earlier we looked at God's promise of a man who would redeem and pay for mankind's sin debt. Around 6,000 years after that promise was made, we see that man arrive on the scene to fulfill the prophecies spoke of him. Jesus would first arrive in a manger in Bethlehem because 6,000 years prior, man willingly made the decision to sin. Think about this. In Genesis 3, the woman was tricked into sin because she wasn't there when God gave the instructions. The instructions were given to Adam. Adam then relayed them to Eve. Eve was tricked into eating the fruit. Adam did it willingly and knowingly. And because of that, the sin nature in mankind comes through the man. So, this is why Jesus had to be born of a virgin. Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, came to fulfill the law. He came to make atonement for our sins as the animal sacrifice did in the Mosaic Covenant. So you may have heard that said before that he came to fulfill the law, but you didn't really know exactly what that meant. Because no man can live and obey the law God placed before Israel in Exodus 20 through 31, Jesus came to live and obey all 613 laws, commandments, guidelines, and standards. Because eventually, a sacrifice would have to be made that wasn't from a perfect spotless animal. Jesus came to be obedient, becoming the one and only human who would live and never break one of those laws. After living a perfect life, just as one of those sacrificial animals, Jesus would be the human sacrifice to pay for the first sin committed by mankind and every sin afterward. His innocent blood was shed on the cross as payment or compensation for all of our sins. As 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. After he sacrificed his life for our sins, the power of God in Jesus brought him back from the dead, and he walked out of that tomb and was seen by hundreds on Easter morning. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Paul tells of this. He says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, 
and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen by Cephas or Peter then by the twelve. When Jesus Christ fulfilled the Mosaic covenant, he made a covenant, an unconditional covenant. This new covenant promises to make an everlasting covenant with his people, Israel, in which he will write his law on their hearts, bring complete forgiveness of their sins, put spirit in them to empower them to love and obey his commands, raise up a faithful Davidic king to rule over them, to bring them back into the land, to reunify them as, as one people under God, and to cause Israel to be a light to all nations. Because Israel rejected Jesus as their Messiah, that covenant extends to us, to Gentiles, as Paul talks about in Romans 11, when he mentions the, the, the limb grafted into the olive tree. That limb is Gentiles. That limb is us. This whole thing of redemption, of Jesus coming to do this for us, Reminds me of an illustration that I heard as a teenager. And I've heard it a couple times and it has always stayed with me. There was a boy who had painstakingly built a model sailboat. He had spent many days and weeks carefully crafting and building this. And when it was finally completed, he decided that he would, he would test it out on open waters just right outside of his house. The boy loved the boat. He was so proud of the boat. So when he went down to the water, first, he made sure the sails were just right. And he put it in the water, and when everything was finally completed, he decided he, he would push it out. And with great anticipation, he gently pushed it out into the water, and it took off. The wind caught the sails, and the boat started cutting through the water, and, and it was doing much better than he anticipated. The boat skimmed along so smoothly so smoothly that the boy realized it was drifting further and further away. It didn't stop. It just kept going. He was hoping that the wind would shift and bring it back toward the shore, but it didn't. The sailboat started to rapidly go off into the distance. The boy quickly jumped in the water and waded after it with the hope of catching up to it and bringing it back. But it had gone too far out. The water was getting too deep for him. And the boat faded off into the distance. And disappeared. It was gone. His boat. His creation. When he got home. He was crying. And his mother saw him and said. What, what's wrong? Did, didn't it work? Didn't it, did it sail? Didn't it float? The boy replied. Yes. It, it actually worked too well. It sailed away. Sometime, days, weeks later, the boy was walking downtown by a second-hand store. And there in the window, he saw his sailboat that he had labored to build. He went to the store and went up to the sailboat. He picked it up and he said to the store owner, This boat is mine. He held in his arms proudly and he began to walk out of the store. And the owner said, Whoa, wait a minute now. That boat's mine. I paid someone for it. The boy said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. This boat is mine. I made it. Look, there's scratches on the side of it. My initials are carved on the bottom of it. This boat is mine. The owner said, I'm sorry, son. If you want it, you're going to have to pay for it. The poor little guy didn't have any money. And so he decided to go home and do odd jobs around the house to try to earn money. And he saved his pennies until he had just enough. And he went back to the store and walked up to the store owner. And he handed him all that money and he bought his sailboat. And as he left the store holding the sailboat close to his chest... You could hear the little boy saying, little boat, you're mine now twice. 
You're my boat first because I made you. And you're my boat second because I bought you. You see, the little boy loved his boat. He had special affection for it because he made it. Now, he could have easily just left it at the store and gone home and made another one. But he chose to redeem it. He created it, and he chose to do whatever was necessary to buy it back. And when it comes down to it, we are an awful lot like that toy sailboat. We have all been carried away from our creator by the bonds of sin. And we desperately needed someone to redeem us. So what does all this mean for us? What bonds break for us under this new covenant? Under the new covenant, Christ broke our bonds of sin by fulfilling the law. So we have no responsibility to the Mosaic covenant for the purposes of salvation. The Mosaic law now serves to lead humanity to understand our corruption and the impossibility to uphold it. Just like Israel, we couldn't stand under the righteous requirements of the Mosaic law. Then in this, where do we find our Christian ethic? In John 15. In John 15, 9, Jesus is speaking to his disciples before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray before he is arrested and later crucified. Jesus says to them, As the Father loved me, I also have loved, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandment, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. This is my commandment, the one and only commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Now, because we don't have to worry about the Ten Commandments and all those other laws, we have one thing to do. And that is to love one another as he loved us. If we follow Christ's commands, we can't break any of the aspects of the Ten Commandments, nor any aspect of God's morality, which we find in every New Testament author's writings. That is our ethic, to love one another as he loved us. And it is born by faith in and love for Christ, rather than from fear of breaking the law. In the Old Testament, their action of good works was to be the way they thanked God for saving them. We are to do good works and the old covenant law can guide us in the kinds of works that please our Lord. Do you suffer from the fear of following orders in order to please God? Thinking that if I don't do this, he's going to be mad. And I'm going to lose favor with him. And, and I, I'm going to have to do other good works just to get back in favor with him. God doesn't want from us what we can do. He just wants us. And so, if you're living according to that fear of if I mess up, he's not going to love me. I have to keep every single thing and do it perfectly or else I will be judged. We don't live under that anymore. When we are saved, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit because Jesus bought us with his sacrifice. So we are to love one another as he loved us. Won't you break away from that old and start living in the light of the new covenant? But maybe there's someone in here or someone that's listening online and you've never heard that Jesus came to be that perfect sacrifice like those animals in the Old Testament. He came to be the sacrifice and payment for our sin. And you'd like to know a little bit more about that, about how your sins can be forgiven. Because sin is anything we say, do, or think that displeases God. If you have questions about that, come down here at the invitation.
speak to David, uh, get a hold of me. We would be happy to show you how you can know that Christ has saved you and set a place for you in heaven. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this time to look at your word. And we thank you for that sacrifice that you made. That God, not only did you make us, but you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to fulfill the law, live a perfect life, and to buy us back so that we can be your children. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for what you do for us every single day. Lord, I just pray if there's someone in here who needs to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they can be your child, that God, they will take care of that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jim. I don't know about you, but I'm certainly glad that every time I mess up, I sin, that I don't have to go out in the pasture and find me a big bull and cut it open. I mean, that, that just, I'd be doing that every day, wouldn't you? But Jesus paid the ultimate price with his life and his blood. How could we not love him for that? Please stand as we sing more love to thee, O Christ. It's hymn number 453 in your hymnal. We'll do verses 1, oh, I'm sorry, 1, 2, and 4. Folks, let us hear this word of blessing. Go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.